Good Sunday morning. Grace and peace to all of you, and thank you for your interest in the Geneva class in our virtual edition. Thank you for uh, your interest in the study of First John. You know, some time ago I was reading from a reputable church historian who made the interesting comment that the concern, the greatest concern of Christians through the centuries, through the years, has been, can I be sure that I will be saved when I die, when I leave this earth? Can I be certain of my salvation? Sometimes that's articulated, sometimes it's just thought. Now, there are many passages in the Bible which affirm our assurance of salvation, but probably the most uh, straightforward and the one book that is just dedicated to it is the one we're studying, First John. Because the thesis is, I've written these things to you who believe, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So let's join the study. I do hope it's a blessing to you, and you hear the truth, and that God receives the glory for it. We're looking at 1 John 2, verses 1 to 14. And I'm going to title this study today john writes to his children and gives the reasons why and i remind you what we looked at last week that this book has a unique structure it is not outlinable if i can use that word when you outline something you make a point and then you move to another point and you move to another point and you leave the previous points behind if we see this book as the upward spiral that Linsky suggests it is, it's not a matter of leaving a point. It's a matter of establishing the basic simple truths at the beginning and then continuing to progress with those thoughts and expand those thoughts until we reach this final conclusion, you may know. So we looked at some of them last week. We'll continue today. The text in the first six verses reads, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Well, who are the little children? We think that he probably is simply talking to everyone in his audience, all the people that he knew. He's in Ephesus at this time. He's an old man. This is the end of the first century. It's been about 60 years since he was with Christ on earth as a part of the uh, disciples, the uh, appointed apostles. And, and now he is talking to believers whom he's come to know over the years. They're in Ephesus. And he uses this interesting word, technia. That's not the word normally for children. It's a diminutive form of an address like dear friends, beloved, something like that. Now, he is old at this time. And when you get a certain point in life, everybody seems young. So I'm sure to John, everybody was younger that he knew. And, and probably because he was an old man speaking to younger people, he uses this diminutive form. And he's also probably attached to them as a kindly father, a person they love dearly. And he says, I am writing to this, so writing this to you so that you will not sin. That's the purpose in my writing, so you will not sin. Now, he established earlier, we looked at this last week, there is absolutely no way that a person can say, I am beyond sinning. You never reach the point that you're beyond sinning. You do, as you progress toward Christ uh, and, and the restoration of his image in your life, you do tend to sin less and less and less. And to you, it seems like you're sinning more and more and more. 
but that's the way sanctification works. But we can never reach the point of saying, I am without sin. And John says, if that's the case, you're a liar. You're deceiving yourselves. The truth is not in you. So he's writing that they not sin, but if and when they do, he is saying, here's the good news about it. We have an advocate with the Father. An advocate, that's a legal term. This is uh, an office that we see in courts, uh, in forensic activity. You hire a lawyer to defend you before a judge or a jury. And Christ is our defender, our advocate. The word for advocate comes from two Greek words, para and kletos. Para means beside. Kletos is from the verb kaleo, call. In this case, called, called beside. One who is called to another's side to help. You call upon the lawyer to come and help me in this case, help defend me in this case. That's normally the situation. Now, he is our advocate or our paraclete, parakletos. Sometimes the word advocate applies to the Holy Spirit. Here it applies to Christ, of course, Christ working with the Spirit. Now, there's a difference between our advocate Christ and a defense lawyer whom we might hire to help us in a court case. The lawyer whom we hire would plead our innocence. His job is, is to defend the person charged, the defendant, uh, by pointing out to the judge, to the jury, that he is really innocent of the charges brought against him. That's not the case with our advocate Christ. Our advocate pleads before the judge, God the Father, based on the merit of Christ, not on our merit. As a matter of fact, he would admit to the guilt of his client. He admits to our guilt. Yes, we have sinned. And we have no merit to bring to this case. We have nothing at all to offer to the judge, to the jury, in this case, to the judge, supreme judge of the universe, nothing but Christ does. He offers himself. And so it is on Christ's merit that he pleads our case, simply saying to the Father, I know this person who believes in me has sinned, but I have paid the price on the cross. And therefore, based upon my atoning for his sins, I plead that you will accept him. So in this case, Christ is called the righteous one, the only one who is truly righteous. And therefore, he has abundant merit to plead the case for all of us. And in so doing, we read in verse 2 that he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In salvation, in redemption, Christ does much for us in many ways. He does die for us and offer a sacrifice. He is a substitute. Uh, to endure the punishment. He does uh, restore us. Uh, he does reconcile us to the Father. And among the things that he does for us is to propitiate us. Now that word, interesting word, means simply to turn away wrath. It actually came originally from the pagan world, but uh, that does not apply directly here because, of course, pagan gods were not true. And they didn't really have any wrath, of course. But the true God does have wrath because he's holy and because our sins are an offense to his holiness. And therefore, we are fit subjects of his wrath. We are just and fit subjects of his wrath. So what our advocate does for us is to turn away that wrath, to satisfy it, to say to the Father, Father, there is no longer any occasion for you to be angry uh, to be wrathful toward this person. I have paid the price, and now I claim him as, as your own. Now, uh, Steve Brown used to say on his uh, program, uh, we need to understand God isn't mad at us. He isn't angry with us anymore. Why isn't he? Because of the propitiation of Christ. God has every just right to be wrathful. But he would be unjust if he did not accept 
the propitiation of his son based on the son's merit. So where, when sins are propitiated, there remains no more wrath. Having been justified by faith, Paul wrote to the Romans, we are delivered from wrath through him. Now, question comes up. He is the propitiation for our sins, but John adds this interesting statement, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, I've just said, when sins are propitiated, there remains no more wrath. So if John means by the word world, every single person who has ever lived, the totality of humanity, then of course we'd have universal salvation because there's no wrath and everyone would be saved. Well, of course, the word world, cosmos, which means an arrangement of something, the word world is used, I think, in about seven different ways in the Bible. And in this case, I'm going to suggest to you that the world implies here different categories of people. That's one way it is used in Scripture. You have to look to the context to see how it's used. We'll see in a moment how it's used in a different way. So, John is stressing, I believe, the universality of the gospel. Remember, he is writing to his little children who are probably, for the most part, Gentiles. They're living in Ephesus, the Gentile city, a Greek city that now is a Roman city. And he is telling them, look, Christ has propitiated our sins, the sins of the Jewish people, the, our sins, the apostles, whatever our means, but he's propitiated your sins. And anyone, regardless of where you live, when you live, regardless of any status that you might have, your race, your nationality, the propitiating of Christ will apply to every believer in Christ. And so the thought begins now to expand in verse 3. By this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Linsky says, John's facts circle upward and outward. Think of that spiral, upward and outward, in a natural inner sequence. Every new circular sweep has its plainly marked center so that every statement is closely integrated. The weave unfolds itself in a perfect pattern and design. You think of that spiral, it's going up, 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 and it's going out, out, but there's a center that remains constant. Now, that center that remains the same would be these, these basic words, these simple words that John introduces and uses and develops, like light and love and life and fellowship. And now he adds the word commandment to the concept of fellowship, and it becomes a governing fact. In other words, commandment and keeping of commandments is integral to our fellowship with Christ and with the Father and with each other. And adding a new concept tells us that we are rising and broadening. And so we must remember all that has been previously said. We don't forget anything and move on to a new topic. It's the same topic that goes upward and outward. And then he gives this example. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. We saw before, if you claim to walk in the light, and you're really walking in the darkness, you're lying. Truth's not in you. Same thing is true here. Really, it's indeed the same thing, but a specific a situation. To claim that we know him, and at the same time, not keep his commandments makes one a liar. It's a false claim as the false claim to fellowship. Now, keeping commandments is not the means by which we are saved. We are not saved. Let me repeat it and put it in a different way. We are not saved because we keep commandments. That's legalism. And that's not the gospel. We are saved because of Christ. We are saved because we have put our trust in Christ a faith that is given to us as a gift, and we have now trusted Christ using that gift. And the keeping of commandments is an outworking of that. 
It is the result of that. Once our hearts are changed, once we trust in Christ, then we want to please God, and so we want to keep his commandments. And then when we look at our commandment keeping, never perfect commandment keeping, but increasingly commandment keeping, we can say, I know him. The way to know God truly and to have fellowship is to keep his commandments. That is a, a manifestation of our right relationship with God. And, and John is saying here that this person who keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. Notice how he states the negative. Always with John, to state a negative is going to affirm the positive. So if you say you know him and don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. But if you do keep his commandments, his word in this case, then in you, truly, the love of God is perfected. Well, what is meant by that? Is John saying our love for God is perfected? Or is John saying God's love for us is perfected? Well, Dr. Boyce thinks it is both, and probably it is. But Linsky thinks it is he's referring particularly to God's love for us. And I think Linsky has a point here. And the reason is in chapter four of this letter, where John is going to write, it is not that we first loved him, but he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. In other words, God's love for us is clearly primary. And so I think above everything else, as we keep his commandments and as we walk in the light, keeping his word, that perfects God's love for us. Not that God doesn't love us all along, but now we know, we know that God loves us. And we know that we love God. Linsky says, the discussion advanced to the thought of truly knowing him and knowing that we know him and are in union with him. So we know him by keeping his commandments. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk the same way in which he walked. Again, you make the claim, then the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. The proof of that is in the outworking of it. You claim that you know him, and then to affirm that claim, you walk as he walked. Now, we can see from this statement very clearly that we can know that we know him. And thus, we can know that we are saved. But also, John says, we know that we have known him. And he uses there the perfect tense. And, and that, of course, means that this knowledge of God has its roots in eternity past. It is a, a truth today, and it has implications forever because it shall not change. So to say we we know that we've known him in the perfect tense would mean since we came to faith in Christ, we have truly know, known him, and we are confirming that as we keep his commandments. So to know God is to have true fellowship with him. Now, if we back away again to look at those simple words, that core that Linsky was talking about, that center of the spiral, light, truth, word, commandment. When we look at these as facts, then they are known as doctrines, and they become the doctrines of the Christian faith. But, as you see John is using them here, they can refer to conduct and life, which he describes by the verb walk. To walk is to live. It, it refers to the way you live, your conduct in your life. And when we look at it from that standpoint, these words are moral and ethical. So they're both doctrinal and moral or ethical. And, and the point about this, and it, the reason we need to look at it, is that these doctrines, these moral and ethical imperatives, are based in reality. And so true certainty, being certain, requires a divine objective base. All of it needs to have been, been historical, been true, 
uh, have, have a basis in what actually happened as contrary to the philosophies offered by such as the Gnostics. This is how we can be certain. All that we believe as Christians and the way we live as Christians is based on reality. Now, this matter of knowing God was prophesied in the Old Testament, particularly in the prophecy of Jeremiah. For instance, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, Jeremiah writes, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Reminds me of Paul's statement to the Corinthians that uh, uh, God forbid that I should boast, save in the cross of Christ. And, and so Jeremiah is saying, don't boast in your wisdom. Don't boast in your power and might. Don't boast in your riches. If you want to boast, the one thing you can boast in is that you understand and know God. That I, the Lord, am the one who practices love. And watch these doctrines, the same doctrines we see in the Christian faith. Love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. And then in chapter 31, uh, a verse with which we are familiar. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Exactly what John is writing. From the beginning, you have known me. And that is a truth of the Christian faith. And we must contrast that with Gnosticism, because I think that's the reason for John writing this letter. Gnosticism has no basis in ethics and righteousness, none whatsoever. It does not involve knowing a person. Gnosticism, as well as all of the philosophies that are out there and various religions and various sects, it involves ideas, yes, things, yes, mystical experiences. But these ideas and things and mystical experiences are things that people have concocted and set forth with no basis, no foundation, no rationale, no reason. All of the doctrines of Gnosticism and philosophy and mysticism, they're emotional experiences, but they do not satisfy the whole person. One of the major reasons that Christianity triumphed over paganism, over Judaism, over mysticism and all of the isms in the Roman Empire in the early days and, and, and conquered the Roman Empire and beyond was the fact that Christianity could offer something to the whole person. It, it offered love and concern and care and genuine worship that meant something. It's more than an emotional experience. It has its emotional aspects. But it's, again, I say it over and over again, it is founded in reality, the concrete facts of historical reality. Now, Gnosticism is transient. It's for the moment. It's not permanent. But knowing God is manifested in obedience, and that's a real thing. And obedience, then, is proof to us that we know him and are in him, proof that we have known him from the beginning. And then John continues, beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you've heard. At the same time, it's a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, before we leave this scripture, I would call to your attention the fact 
that we have some of the key words, the simple words that are in that core of the spiral. You have, for instance, light, and you have darkness, you have commandment, uh, and you have a life. But there's something here that is, is, is a little bit different and something that causes people some consternation. I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment, all right? But then he says the old commandment is the word. And here's the key to understanding it. At the same time, it is a new commandment. At the same time, it is old and new. What does he mean by that? Well, obviously, he is expanding from obedience to the commandments of God, to the word, to love of brothers. And he is saying that is a commandment you've had from the beginning. Probably he means from the beginning of your experience as Christians, from the time you were saved and put your faith in Christ. Of course, if you had been a Jew, you had studied this old commandment before. What is that old commandment? Well, it's in Leviticus 19 and verse 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That is an old commandment. How can it be at the same time a new commandment? Not a separate commandment, but at the same time a new commandment. Well, that new commandment has been modified by Christ. And there is where the expansion occurs. It is expanded to a new extent. Under the old commandment for Israel, they were to love their fellow Jews, but they were to hate Gentiles. They were to hate sinners, but not be that they were obligated to love them. That would be even wrong. They are to confine their love to their fellow Israelites. So it has a new extent in Christ because Christ loved sinners and Christ loved Gentiles and Christ loves all. And he defines neighbors in terms of everyone and certainly of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then it is expanded by going to new links, a length never thought of really under the old system. Jesus would say, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends if you do what I tell you. And he demonstrated that in giving his life on the cross, laying down his own life, new links and a new degree as they traveled about with Christ and as they came to know Christ, they, they saw genuine love in him and in his disciples such as they had never seen before. So old commandment, yes. New commandment, yes, at the same time. And then John adds, the darkness is passing away and the true light is shining. What darkness? The dark night of paganism. The dark night of legalism, whether it is Roman legalism or Greek legalism, or Jewish legalism, the dark night of mysticism, all of that's passing away. And the true light, and there's that key word again, that true light that is Christ is already shining. Here's Henry's comment on these words. Here we may observe how effectually our apostle is now cured of his once hot and flaming spirit, Time was when he was calling for fire from heaven upon poor, ignorant Samaritans who received them not, Luke 9, 54. But his Lord had shown him that he knew not his own spirit, nor whither it led him. Having now imbibed more of the spirit of Christ, he breathes out goodwill to man and love to all the brethren. It is the Lord Jesus that is the great master of love. It is his school his own church that is a school of love. His disciples are the disciples of love and his family must be the family of love. Yes, what Henry's talking about, if you remember in that passage in John 9, at the time that, that, that John and James, his brother, wanted to call down fire from heaven upon the Samaritans who didn't receive them. How much John has changed by being with Christ. Here's a comment Jesus made that is so similar to what John is saying about old and at the same time new. In Matthew 13, as he is giving them the parables, he turned to his disciples and he said, have you understood all these things? And they said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe 
who's been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And so we bring out of our treasure of our hearts the new along with the old. It's old because it's been with us since God spoke to man. But it's new because of Christ and what we have learned from Christ. And John continues, whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So he's expanding on this teaching about loving our brothers. And here, one claiming that he's walking in the light at the same time hating his brother. It's the same thing as, as claiming you have fellowship with him and walking in darkness. Now, the Gnostics made all kinds of claims. They were professions, but they didn't have any basis. And so, and like the Gnostics, this would be a profession without love, and therefore it would be meaningless. The Gnostics claimed that they were enlightened, but they didn't act as if they were enlightened. So John is making the, an expansion on this claim to walk in the light while still walking in the darkness, and, and here applying it to our love for our brothers. So whoever says he's in the light and hates his brothers is still in darkness. That's the negative. The positive, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And then John adds something. In him, there is no cause for stumbling. The word stumbling here uh, can be translated, as some do, entrapment. <laughs> The word is scandalon, the verb is scandalizo. It refers to a trap you set out for an animal to trap him. Now, and you don't have good designs on the animal you, you capture. So is he talking about if there's no cause of an entrapment that you present to your brother if you love him? Well, yes, of course not. That, of course it's true. You would not trap your brother if you love him. You would not do anything to cause him harm thus setting a scandal on or a trap for him. Or does it refer to you yourself? Well, it does also, because if you truly love your brother, you're not going to entrap yourself in sin by hating him. And, and the effect of love on a person rather than hate is tremendous because it changes his whole attitude and bearing and demeanor from the heart inward, outward in his actions. So there's no cause of entrapment in him, cause for hurting his brother or cause for hurting himself. Hatred of a brother, John says, is blindness. And a person who hates his brother is walking in blind situations. He doesn't know where he's going. He's stumbling along. And then he continues. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers because you know him who's from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Now, obviously, John is dividing up his audience. He could be dividing them by age, or he could be dividing them by their position in Christ. In other words, are they babes in Christ, feeding on the milk of the word, or are they adults, feeding on the meat of the word, so to speak? And we can't be exactly sure. I am inclined to believe he's talking about differences in age. Now, he starts out by saying, I'm writing to you little children, that's exactly the way he started this second chapter. I'm writing to you, little children. And again, he uses this word technia, which is that term of endearment. And based on the similarity of this statement in verse 12 to verse 1, I would suggest that he is using it in exactly the same sense. I'm talking to all of you and looking upon you as my dear children, my dear brothers and sisters. And for all of them, regardless of their age, regardless of how far along they are in their spiritual journey, this is true. 
Your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. That is the material cause of forgiveness. We're forgiven for the sake of the name of Christ, and that name meaning all that he stands for. That is the reason sins are forgiven, not for anything that we have done, but for his name's sake. Now, I'll let you decide whether he's talk, we're talking about spiritual maturity or about maturity of age. And of course, we understand that uh, to speak of fathers and, and children in this sense, that women are included under the male generic, as is the case so often. And the verbs are in the perfect tense, which means that uh, their salvation and their relationship to God is rooted in eternity past. It is true today and will be true forever. And he assures them all that he has absolutely no doubt that they know God. So he continues by saying, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. So let's assume that he's talking to older people. And older Christians need to be reminded that they have known God from the beginning of their experience in the faith. From the time you put your trust in Christ, from that time you have known God. Now, you come to understand God more clearly as you progress, but you have known God, meaning you have been in a relationship with God. The word no, gnosko, implies God's acceptance of you and approval of you. Now, Calvin makes comments along through all of these different categories that sound a little bit negative. And I think what he does is to try to point out why this writing is needed. And he says in reference to the old, the old for the most part steal away as if they had exceeded the age of learning. Now, for the most part, I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, I do know of some people who will say, I've served in the church, I've done my thing, and now I'll just retire from it. But I, I think uh, as we, the people we encounter are people who in their age are becoming more zealous and more dedicated because they're learning more and more. So uh, yet it's still, of course, important to say, you have known him from the beginning. And that's an encouraging statement. And it's repeated in verse 14. And then he says, I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Now, commentators suggest if you talk about young men, you're talking about young adults. You're talking about adults in the very height of their strength, physical strength, perhaps mental strength, but the time that they can most effectively wage the battles against Satan, that they can take their place and fight the good fight of faith in the church. But he wants to say to them something very important. Yes, you are engaged in a battle against Satan. Yes, the Bible teaches that. But understand, and you can see this from the book of Revelation, if you look carefully at it, the battle is won before it's ever engaged. The battle is won at the point of your faith. It's already over and done with. And yet you fight the good fight of faith. Satan is a defeated enemy. He may rage on, but he is defeated. And that's the message John is getting across to them, you have overcome the evil one. Calvin, again, taking a more negative approach to point out the need for this, says uh, middle-aged men, and we can think of young adults as well, do not attend because they're engaged with other affairs. Well, that's true. We sometimes see people saying, well, I'm, I'm too busy. I've got my family. I've got my work. I've got to my uh, recreation or whatever. So yes, we need to be engaged in it. But we need to know that our sins are forgiven. The young need to know that. They are forgiven and they know God. And they need to understand their victory over the devil. And they need to understand that they are strong. Their strength is Christ. And they need to know where that true strength is found. And then he says, I write to you children because you know the Father. Now, Calvin will say, children refuse to hear, as if they're not yet old enough, sometimes true. But we see many, many children who are taught in the home, 
and whose parents bring them to church. And there at church, there is a ministry to the children to teach them at their level, and they grow and they prosper. And I'm reminded that uh, this was the first directive to the Apostle Peter at the time that the Lord restored him to his position. He said, feed my lambs. So I think children are usually receptive. And if they are provided a, a, an encouraging ministry in church, they will grow. But they need the message all along. That they need the message that they know the Father. And that's a consistent message to all of these groups of people. And then John concludes, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. I told you a moment ago that we'd see another example of the way that the word world is used. And there are many ways it's used, perhaps as many as seven. Of course, in this case, John is talking about the world in the sense of the realm of evil that is opposed to God, that lies beyond his will. That is the way he uses world there. And he says, do not love that world. If you love that world, the love of the Father is not in you. And all that's in that world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father. It's from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, it's interesting. John uses agapao. That's the high form of love that involves intelligence and intent and purpose and understanding. James, in the fourth chapter of his letter, says essentially the same thing, but he uses the word phylos, which means an affection. However, he includes intent in that. If anyone wants to like the world. And so really, John James is saying the same thing that John does. So when John divides up the world into three categories, he said all that's in the world is the lust of flesh, lust of eyes, and pride of life. I think he's right. That's the aspect of the world that opposes God. That's, those are the component elements of it. And if you look at two times in redemptive history, when it was so critical that the world be, be defeated, and that in the Garden of Eden, and secondly, when Jesus was tempted by the devil, because in the Garden of Eden, the fate of mankind was in the balance. If Adam, as head of the human race, and his wife Eve, of course, uh, failed the probationary test of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then mankind would fall into sin. And that's exactly what happened. All men sin. Sin comes upon all. We are born sinners. And let's look at what happened. In the Garden, the devil confronted Eve with the fruit of the knowledge of true tree of good and evil, which had been forbidden to them. And Eve saw through the devil's influence that it was good for food. What is that? That's the lust of the flesh. Did Eve resist that temptation? No, she succumbed to it. On the other hand, Jesus, tempted by the same devil, was uh, encouraged to change the stones into bread after a 40 days fast, and he was hungry, and Jesus resisted that temptation by appealing to scripture. It is written, you shall not live by bread alone. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the devil tempted Eve, look at this fruit, and she saw it was a delight to the eyes. What did she do? She succumbed to the temptation. Then the same devil tempted Jesus. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, I'll give them to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Again, Jesus resisted the temptation by appealing to scripture. It is written that you shall love the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And thirdly, the pride of life. Eve was tempted when she saw that the fruit was desired for wisdom to make one wise. Again, she succumbed 
when she took the fruit and she ate it, and men fell in the garden. Jesus, tempted by the same devil, was encouraged to throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple, and God would send angels to bury him up lest he dash his foot against a stone, and Jesus re resisted again. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So we have this unique structure, the upward spiral. And we've looked at several other expansions as we move along the way. And we'll continue to do that, Lord willing, next week. Again, thank you for your interest. Thank you for studying with us from this portion of the second chapter of John's first letter. I hope you have a wonderful week, a blessed week that the Lord will bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, and he will lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.